this morning, I'm actually going to talk about uh, the Word, and, um, oops, back, wrong way, let's go this other way, huh? Um, and uh, it, it, it sort of serendipitously, I think you guys know that I'm reworking a number of my books that went out of print, and one of the books that went out of print was called How to Become a Man of the Word, and numerous ladies have come to me and said, well, what's the deal anyway, you know, I mean, how come it's like for guys? And I'm sure that more women have read it than guys anyway, because women read books more than you guys. Anyway, um, so I redid it and I, I took the uh, gender out of it. It's for men and women now. Yeah, I actually I added a gender to it, I guess, is what I did. So uh, men and women. But uh, I, it actually became available this week. And I've got about 20 copies out there if you want to grab one. Anytime you buy a book from out there, by the way, I don't get any money. Uh, but you actually are giving a few dollars to the church because the difference between what the cost of the books are and, and uh, what we're charging you, these exorbitant rates of 10 bucks a book, um, uh, goes toward the church. So anyway, there's a few out there, but it's also on Amazon. And if you're an ebook reader, it's on Kindle too. But uh, serendipitously that this kind of got finished up and made available, uh, because this is what I'm going to talk about this morning. I'm going to talk about the Word. And you know, um, the vast majority of people uh, in America do not, and most of them have not, read the Bible. Now, I'm not talking about, oh, I flipped it open once and read, you know, a page here and there, but re- generally, I'm talking about someone that has seriously read the Bible. I mean, even just out of curiosity, most haven't. And, and the result of that, really, is that we know that we live in the greatest period of biblical illiteracy in our nation's history. It, it's really quite amazing, and I've spoken about that before. But I think what's more troubling And uh, I know this isn't true of any of you, uh, but what's more troubling to me is the fact that many Christians don't read the Bible. And and I, and I, I talk with people all the time that really have some kind of a relationship with Christ, but but they don't read the Bible, and I, I can't even fathom how to have a relationship with Christ without uh, consistently spending time in the Word. And we're told that the average believer in churches has about a, the equivalent of about a sixth grade understanding of the Bible. So, you know, think about, again, and I've, I've, again, on a number of occasions I've said, gee, if somebody says to you, I don't believe in the Bible, you know, the first question, again, I encourage you to always ask is simply to ask them, have you read it? And, um, and let's suppose you ask that question, and what they, ask, what, they, what they answer you is this, that in response, instead of saying yes, no, or whatever, they, they say, well, why should I do that? Why should I read the Bible? Now, understand, this is, and this is not something that Christians say, I would say all historians, without some kind of insane bias, would tell you that this is the most influential book in the history of Western civilization. I mean, this is a book that has shaped who we are, and I know today that's why it's so crazy, you know, that people, I mean, many people never, ever read it. Or maybe they would ask you the question, what's so special about the Bible? And uh, the answer to that question, partially, uh, that hopefully you'll be able to give them, is found in a song. A song written by King David for his chief musician. So maybe it was Asaph. It was his Biff Gore anyway. And... uh, Anybody's guess. And that song, the lyrics to that song, occupy the 19th spot in the book of Psalms, or what we're calling God's greatest hits, and I'm picking it as one of my top 10. It was interesting, as I was doing some study this week, I ran across a quote by C.S. Lewis, and I'd never heard this before. Oh, wrong way. C.S. Lewis said this about Psalm 19. I take this to be the greatest poem in, and he actually said the Psalter, because that's a little more British, you know, um, in the Psalms, and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. So for C.S. Lewis, this was not only in his top ten, this was number one in his top ten. And it's an amazing, it's an amazing psalm, and it's all about how God makes himself known to us. So let's read a couple of verses here just to get started. And the psalmist David writes this, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. 
Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Again, this is a psalm about, and we're going to see two big major pieces of the psalm. It's a psalm about how God has made himself known. You know, how can we know anything about God? And again, you know, for those of you that have heard me speak on this before, you know, excuse the repetition, but I think it really fits in this psalm. You know, what are the options about knowing anything about God? And I would say there are three possible options. And the first would be, you know, the scientific method. Can you know God simply by human reason and rationalism? Now, it's interesting because if you go back through the history of the church, there are times when people would have answered that question, yes, there are ways that you can rationally come to some sort of conclusion about the existence of God. And probably the most uh, common that people would know about would be during the 13th century when uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas uh, came up with his five proofs for the existence of God. Interestingly enough, by the way, the fifth of his proofs had to do with the idea that, uh, that creation seemed to have some sort of design to it. It didn't seem to be random and chaotic, and, and the argument was, well, if there's design, there, that surely there must be a designer. Now, later, um, it, science got to a point, and, I, and again, it, interestingly, they didn't get it right, but they did get to a point where they believed that, that they could explain creation without having to say that there was any personality behind it. And, and a lot of what came from, a lot of where that came from was that, you know, there was a time when in terms of uh, cosmology, the study of, of origins of the universe, that, uh, that scientists held a theory that was called the steady state theory. And the steady state theory basically um, uh, said that, that the universe is infinite and that it's always been exactly the way it is. In other words, it's been in a a steady state. Matter, time, space, always been the way that it is. And that theory really, um, I would say, was popular up through even the 1950s. And there's still a few random scientists that hold to that. But most don't because science has a whole new batch of understanding. And, of course, I've talked about this uh, quite a bit, actually, in the last few weeks. But, but there are others that have asked the question, you know, it, is there a beginning to the universe? And see, if there actually is a beginning to the universe, then the steady state theory doesn't hold. Because if there's a beginning, then you have to come up with some explanation of, well, how did it begin? Now, I'm not an astrophysicist. There was a time when I wanted to be, but I decided to play football instead. Uh, no. So... So hang with me here, because I know most of you are probably more scientific than I am, but I'm reading about this stuff, and it's so fascinating. Um, here's part of what happened. And by the way, you know, at the beginning even of our own century, scientists believed that the Milky Way galaxy was the universe, that that's all there was, because the best technology they had in terms of telescopes, uh, they would look out, and they could see sort of some cloudy spots, you know, beyond the Milky Way, but they just... Um, their, their hypothesis was that, that those were just nebulae or, or you know, space, you know, clouds in space. And it wasn't until around the, the 20s, uh, later 20s, that the technology existed. And actually, the first person to begin to talk about this probably, or one of the first, was a man by the name of Edwin Hubble. And, of course, the Hubble Space Tel- Telegraph today is, is named after him. But, but what began to happen is that uh, they began to, to see things they'd never seen before in science. And, and what they began to understand is that not only... Well, well first of all, it, the ultimate conclusion is, yes, there was a beginning. But what they began to understand was that the universe was not static. The universe was actually expanding, and, and by the way, I think that when David makes this statement, the heavens declare the glory of God, 
Think about what David had at his disposal. David simply could look up at night into the stars, and I think maybe like some of us have had, perhaps, you know, he had almost like a mystical, you know, sense that, that this couldn't exist without a creator. And then he, and actually the second part of the verse, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. It's almost like in the day when you look into the sky, you know, there's something about that. But think about how much more we know about the heavens than David did. And it's amazing because I do think that we live in a time like never before where the heavens are declaring the glory of God. And when we begin to understand something about the incredible scope of the universe and then begin to understand you know, this, this thought that, that not only is the universe expanding, but it's expanding at an accelerated pace. And so, you know, scientists, astrophysicists, you know, as early as, again, the, the 1930s, the first person to suggest this was actually, a, uh, in 1927, prior to, to Hubble, uh, there was a Belgian priest who also taught physics. And he was the first one that said, if this is true, then we can go backwards and, and we can calculate uh, where was that beginning? And then Hubble came along, and, and Hubble really popularized that view. Uh, but what these scientists were ever able to prove is that there was a point in time where the universe as we know it apparently came into existence out of nothing. And you have to explain how did that happen. And we live in a day where many really smart guys... I mean, cosmologists and astrophysicists and people that really know their stuff, they believe there's only one answer. And the answer is that there was a creator. Now, we have to take that a step further, though, because even if you come to that conclusion, uh, it, excuse me, if you come to the conclusion that the universe had a beginning, it, it really isn't necessary proof that you had to have a creator. I mean, there's a lot of theories that people could come up with. But, but then what happened is, is that some of the things that we've been talking about, that this issue began to be debated, is the universe simply a product of random mechanics, or is there some kind of design to it? And again, we live in a time, and you know, I shared the story of Brandon Carter from 1974, and really, in 1974 was the first time that this concept of what was called the anthropic principle, by the way, and we've talked a little bit about it, I know, uh, and what this came from is that scientists began to identify and, and pull together and, and synthesize these conditions that were necessary for complex life to exist, and the more that began to happen, some of these scientists began to ask the question, is this just coincidence? And then they began to ask the question, which is what Brandon Carter did, what are the probabilities that this is just coincidence, and the probabilities were so astronomically uh, large that, it, the, that this is so improbable that this could have just happened by chance that the idea that there was a super intelligent, super powerful creator behind creation. And this isn't just something that church folks are running around talking about. The heavens declare the glory of God. And again, all of this, and, and again, probabilities, and I, I, I love the infinite monkey theorem, and again, I talked about it before, but again, the probabilities of this happening randomly are the same as shutting a monkey in a room with a typewriter and that monkey producing the complete works of Shakespeare. The probabilities of that and of the universe existing by random are about the same. Okay, now, I'd like you to memorize that first verse. The, let's say it together. The heavens declare the glory of God. Now, uh, there's a couple of, along with Psalm 1-1, I also am always uh, think about um, Romans 1-20, where Paul, and Paul might be referring to this text, by the way, but in Romans chapter 1, Paul makes a statement that for the, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal nature and divine nature, his, excuse me, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. Now, theologians refer to this uh, as general revelation. And what, when they say that, what they're saying is, again, 
that somehow in what God has made, he has made his existence and his power known. But you see, there are limitations to that. But this is a big takeaway, so let's start with this one as our first takeaway, that God reveals himself through what he's created. And that's what the text says, and I think that's what much of contemporary science has to say also. But the problem is, uh, even coming to that conclusion, there's a second question. And the second question is, well, if this super intellectual, super powerful being exists, other than knowing of his existence and his power, how can we really know details about what God is like? Uh, how do we relate to him? What does he expect of us? And, and if he exists, why is there so much pain, suffering, and death? I mean, how do you answer those questions? Now, so the first option of knowledge about God, scientific theory, you know, we, we realize it can tell us something, but it can't tell us this. So what are our options in knowing anything about the details of God? And I would say there are only two options, and one would be speculation. In other words, that people simply come up with ideas about what God is like and what life is about and what we're supposed to do. And, and uh, really, I mean, I'm not being critical in any way, but really that's what philosophy and most religion is. It, it's attempts to explain, you know, what God is like, but without any information from God himself. Speculation. And the third option is what we're looking at today, which is revelation. And, and revelation uh, simply would say that God reveals that information and he makes known that which cannot be made known by reason alone. And so Psalm 19, it begins with this big picture of general revelation, and then it answers these questions, because beginning in verse 7, it shifts to where David begins to talk about the special or specific revelation of God. And, and, and here's what the text says. He begins to talk about the Word of God. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Now, the fear of the Lord is pure, one more verse, sorry, enduring forever, and the decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. Here's what special revelation is. So special revelation uh, believes that God has revealed himself and that he's actually personally communicated with certain men and women. And originally, his message that was given to those men and women uh, was passed on through oral tradition. And I'm talking about the Judeo-Christian um, concept of this, which you know, obviously, I believe is accurate. Um, and then sometime around 1500 B.C., Moses comes along, and, and God actually appears to Moses. We, we see that in the book of Exodus. He gives Moses his name, which is a huge revelation, that, because the name tells us something about the nature of God, and so God is the I Am. And, uh, and then God actually wrote down some of his word in the Ten Commandments. He wrote on two stones. He, it was the hand of God that, that at least created the first set uh, of those tablets. But Moses began to write down this revelation that probably had been passed on for hundreds and hundreds of years through oral tradition. Uh, again, uh, conservative tradition is that Moses wrote the first five books uh, of the Bible, um, some scholars debate that, and it's a, you know, it's, a big, it's a big issue. But just 
know that somewhere in point in time, that revelation began to be written down and then passed on rather than through oral tradition, the written word. And again, understand many cultures believed oral tradition was more reliable than the written word. It's very hard for us to get our hands on. But oral tradition in cultures where they, that was how their history was transmitted, it was extremely accurate from generation to generation. And the fear of the written word was that something could happen and those papers could get you know, they could get destroyed and you could lose things or people could change the papers. But anyway, uh, things began to be written around 1500 B.C. And then God began to send prophets and eventually he sent apostles. And by the time we were done, we end up with 66 inspired documents that were contained on scrolls at first and, and later on uh, codices, which were the kind of the beginning of books. And, and they were God-breathed, is what the text tells us. They were inspired, and, and in the New Testament, at least, the word that is said, you know, all Scripture is inspired by God, 2 Timothy 3.16, the word is theanuptas, and it is, the, it is a combination of the word for God and the word for breath. It's God breathed, that God was so involved in the process, it wasn't always a matter of God saying, thus saith the Lord, write down, I'm dictating to you, although at times it was. It, certainly in the Old Testament, the prophets, God told them specifically what to say, but in the New Testament, the process, of course, first of all, you got the words of Jesus, and it is God speaking, the words of Jesus, and that those were you know, preserved with great uh, uh, concern for accuracy because Jesus was God come in the flesh. And, and so, but eventually these 66 documents that at some point in time circulated individually, they began to be collected. And, uh, and we think that the Old Testament was pretty well collected by about 250 B.C. when the Septuagint was written. And, and then as the apostolic documents began to float around, quite early in the history of the church, collections began to be made of authentic books. And probably by at least the third century, the 66 books that we now uh, call Scripture were put together in one large collection called the Book. That's what Bible means. It's the book. Now, in Psalm 119, I mean, excuse me, in Psalm 19, David's somewhat limited with what the Word of God is because it's 1000 BC, and um, pretty much all he has, he has the Torah, the, the five books of the Pentateuch, and he probably has uh, in his possession the history of Israel up to that point in time, but you know, somehow, somewhat limited, prophets, poets, apostles yet to come. But in this psalm, he reflects upon the Word of God, and he really uh, points out five, and I don't even know the word to use here, I, it, either five types or genres or dimensions of revelation. And he uses five different words here. Um, most, you know, most scholars believe they're somewhat synonymous, but, but they aren't identical. They, they give shades and nuances of the things that God communicated. And then every time he names one of these five types of revelation, he comments on a quality about that type of revelation. And then he gives us something of a, a benefit from reading it. So again, if someone were to say, why? Should I read the Bible? Well, you're going to get some answers to that right here in Psalm 19, and we'll, we'll go through these. So type number one is found in verse 7, where David says, The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. And the word here is Torah. The Torah of the Lord. Every one of these phrases, by the way, notice the little expression. They are all followed by the expression of the Lord. In Hebrew, it's actually of Yahweh, and we, you know, transliterate that and use the word Lord here uh, for the proper name of God. But, but all of these then, all of these are, um, uh, you know, defined as being of the Lord. And the first one here, there's two options. One is that he begins with the broad word that almost covers all of this. Uh, but, but maybe he's getting a little more specific because this was a word that talked about... Um, instructions in general. So God speaks to man, and he gives him instructions, and that instruction is called Torah, the law. Now, 
the quality that David points out about the law is this. It is perfect. The law, the law of the Lord, the Torah of Yahweh is perfect, and the word means it's without flaw. It is complete. And everything about it, by the way, again, just the Hebrew concept here is that everything about it is aimed at our well-being. So God communicates and he gives instructions and the purpose of those instructions are for our well-being. They're not to limit so that we don't have fun. He's not the cosmic policeman. He is the loving father that wants us to know who he is, how we relate to him, and what that means. And the law tells us that. And the benefit is awesome. The benefit is that it restores the soul. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. Now, here's what strikes me about this. And I, I think you all probably have experienced this. But I would say that even as believers those in whom Christ dwells by his spirit, that we've, we've opened our lives to Jesus and you know, we've, we've accepted him and we're, you know, the Holy Spirit has come to dwell in us, I would say that the tendency for all of us is that, that the inner life tends toward drifting and atrophy. So you don't attend to it, and the result is one day you kind of wake up and you recognize I am really out of touch here. And, and so what do we need? Well, we need something that revives and renews and revitalizes our soul. And, and that's what David says that the law of the Lord does. It, it renews and it restores and he, God uses his word to do that. So the law of the Lord, it's perfect. It revives the soul. Why should I read the Bible? Well, that's a Relatively good reason right there. And David goes on. The second sort of type of revelation that he tells us about is he says, the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Now, the nuance here, supposedly, is that the, the word that is used here uh, in the Hebrew um, specifically talks about spiritual principles that contain warnings and promises. So you know, just a slight variation on law, statutes. Some of what God gives us in Scripture are statutes. Uh, in other words, it would be as if God was saying, <clears throat> this is the way, <coughs> excuse me, this is the way I created things to work. If you do this, this is what will happen. If you don't do this, this is what will happen. And the quality that David points out, quite important, is that God's statutes are trustworthy. Trustworthy is the word that's used there. And again, this is a word that talks about something that is above doubt and is worthy of our absolute confidence. That you can trust the statutes of God. And the benefit of that is that they will make you wise. Stability is part of the idea of wisdom here. Um, and the idea is that apart from the statutes of God... Um, People get led astray. And by the way, in Psalms, and you'll notice this periodically as you read through them, and certainly in Proverbs, there, there is a, oftentimes where what God does through inspiration is he has the writers make a comparison between the wise and the fool. Now, sometimes the word rather than fool is the simple or the naive. And it simply means someone that has not taken into consideration what God says, and they just kind of go off on their own way, and the, the end of that is that, that they become a fool. And so, uh, <clears throat> thank you. Thanks, Biff. Mm. Break time. All right. Oh, gosh, I just poured it all over my notes. Isn't that great? <laughs> Biff, take this away. No, all right. Uh, all right. Um, so, the benefit that he goes on to say then, it makes you, excuse me, it makes you wise, and, uh, and if you will obey it, you won't be a fool. Uh, it kind of points out the stupidity of doing things that are out of conformity with the way God created the universe. And, and my, my friend uh, Tom Stipe uh, 
pastors of church across town, Crossroads, he, he's sort of well known for his little expression, sin makes you stupid. And that's what the psalmist is saying. You know, that the word of the Lord here, and specifically the statutes of the Lord, will make you wise. They'll keep you from being foolish, naive, or stupid. I have a couple of great definitions of wisdom, by the way, that I love, and I'm just going to show them to you. You could write, jot these down if you wanted to. But somewhere along the line, someone told me that this is what wisdom is, the ability to distinguish between that which is trivial and that which is fundamental. I think that's a great definition of wisdom. What's really important in life? What isn't that important? And, you know, how do you, how do you keep those things in tension? And, what you, and the way you do is you need wisdom. And God will tell you what's really important and what isn't all that important. The second one, uh, excuse me, oh, I, I didn't put it up in here. Um, the second one that I like, too, is that, that wisdom is seeing life from God's point of view. I think that's a great, a great definition also, that the wise person does, and again, we talked about this last week, DVP, HVP, you know, that, that the wise person is able to, he understands the DVP, and he can always process and filter life through what God says. Um, the third type that he, whoops, that he talks about here uh, are the, I'm going backwards, guys, this is just, I'm getting used to using this little gadget. And the arrow that points forward is the forward button, and the one that (laughs) points the other direction. Okay. All right. Here's the next one. Precepts. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. Now, again, little nuance. What is a precept? A precept is a declaration that uh, concerning our obligations toward God. What is it that God expects from us? Well, he tells us because he reveals that, and when he reveals that, and sometimes, by the way, and you, you, depending on what version you have, it actually might be uh, translated as a mandate, uh, sometimes as a commandment, although one of the other words really uh, fits that a little bit better. <clears throat> but he tells us that the precepts, these declarations about, you know, what, what is our obligation toward God, he says that they, that they are right, or, and the, the word literally is straight. And the idea is that, that they point the right way to get to the right goal. And so again, God is just saying, hey, here's what is expected of you, and if you do this, you will be headed in the right direction toward the right goal. And the benefit of that is joy. Joy. It, it, it literally says rejoicing the heart. Isn't that a great expression? That, that God's word will give you joy. And it's the joy, that inner joy, that comes from knowing that you're living in peace and harmony with God. And, and again, why should you spend time in the word? Because it'll give you joy. And who doesn't want joy? And so, again, this is what, what God has, has done. He's given us Precepts, yashar is the Hebrew word there, and again, these declarations. Then he goes on to, to type four, and uh, I'm using a translation that says the commands. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. And, uh, and commands, it, the word is pretty simple. Uh, it, it means imperatives. Do this, don't do this. So sometimes God's word is instructive, and it's teaching us things, but sometimes it's telling us what to do. There's this sense of command to it, and that's what this word, uh, what this word means. And by the way, the Hebrew there is mitzvah. Now, I bet every one of us in the room has heard the word mitzvah. I grew up, uh, when I was in junior high, uh, we moved to Kansas City, and um, we happened to move into a neighborhood, and we didn't know it at the time, but I would say the neighborhood 90% Jewish. And so I'm 13 years old, and all of my friends are Jewish. Well, if you're 13 and you're Jewish, you've got a big day you're looking forward to called your bar mitzvah. Now, literally, that means son of the commandment. And the concept behind it... Uh, was that this was an initiation ceremony where a boy became a man. 
And how a boy became a man, by definition, because I got to tell you, none of my friends became men at that point in time. Uh, some of them still aren't, by the way. Uh, but, uh, but the idea was that you have been taught the commandments. So all my friends went to Hebrew school. You know, they all hated it, by the way. But they went to Hebrew school because they had to learn some stuff to get bar mitzvah because bar mitzvahs, you had this huge party and everybody gave you presents. That was what they really were after. But the idea was that you reach a point where you embrace God's word. That, that it, Now, you don't need somebody to tell you what to do. You don't need someone to kind of keep, you know, you know on your back. You know, you're going to be a man, and a man is a son of the commandments. And this is the word, mitzvah. And, and the word again, has this sense of do this. And the quality of those commands are radiant. Uh, Different translations of the word, it it can mean pure or clear or uh, a source of light. And so metaphorically, uh, the commands are a source of spiritual light. It will enlighten you and ties in with the benefit. It gives light to the eyes. It makes our minds clear and our lives healthy and fresh. And again, interestingly, Old Testament, New Testament, always this contrast between light and darkness. And light always having this sense of goodness and wholeness and that which is pleasing to God and darkness kind of being oblivious and out out of touch. Great prophecy about Jesus that, that we read almost every Christmas out of Isaiah that the people living in darkness have seen a great light. And that was a prophecy of Christ coming out of Galilee. So, uh, So God's word will enlighten you. And then finally, uh, the final word that shows up here are the decrees or ordinances. Depends on what version you have, how that's translated. And and this is the the Hebrew word mishpah, and it's a little bit different from mitzvah. And uh, and it is simply a declaration of what is just. And and so sometimes this is translated the judgments of the Lord. Again, having this sense of right and wrong, but what is right and what is just and what isn't. And the quality of God's decrees or ordinances is that that they're true or they're sure. And, And the idea there is that they're unchangeable. And then actually in the text, and I don't think I've got the rest of the verse up there, he, on this particular one, he, he amplifies and says, they're altogether righteous, they're more precious than gold, they're sweeter than honey, and then their benefit is they warn us. They, they warn us, and in keeping them, there is great reward. Now, let's just put all this together for one second, and we'll, we'll finish up with this. Okay, why should I read the Bible? Well, here's why. Because God's word is perfect, flawless, good for you, trustworthy, instructive, pure, unchanging, and precious. That's part of why you should read it. And if you read it and take it to heart and implement it in your life, it will revive you, make you wise, give you joy, enlighten you, warn you, and reward you. And if you can't figure out that you ought to read the Bible with all of that going, you're beyond help right there, okay? And, uh, and, and so, you know, you put it together. And so, again, the second takeaway is simply this, that God reveals himself through his word. He reveals himself generally through creation, but very specifically, he makes himself known through his word. And David's response is great here, by the way. Um, he says this at the end of the psalm, who can discern his own errors Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I'll be blameless, innocent of great transgression, and a very well-known verse. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I'd suggest you might want to memorize that along with the first verse. The heavens declare the glory of God. And then he reveals himself to me. And my response then, kind of to paraphrase, is let my thoughts, my words, and my actions be such that they're pleasing to you, Lord. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful uh, for your revealed word. And of course, Lord Jesus, ultimately you are the ultimate revelation of God. And and it's got to be why John said that in the beginning was the Word, and he was talking about you, and uh, that the Word, the Word became flesh, the truth of who God is and what He's like and what He expects of us and how to live in a way that's pleasing and, and honoring and rewarding. Lord Jesus, you, you revealed it all. 
And, and, and Lord, at, you know, as you left, you know, you told us that, that you were going to send the Holy Spirit and he would lead us into all truth. And so as your apostles, uh, you know, were filled with your spirit and were witnesses of your resurrection, they, they wrote the New Testament. And so prophets in the old and apostles in the new, you've not left us without knowledge of who you are, who we are, and how we can relate to you. And we are so grateful. And Lord, never, never let us take the Bible uh, for granted. Help us really be men and women that are serious in, in co- consistently and regularly spending time in your word and then seeking with the, your grace and the help of your Holy Spirit to live in the way it instructs us. In your name, Jesus. Amen.